Untamed. Five, four, three, two, one. The Platform. Welcome to the podcast, people. iOS, it's only sport. Marta Devlin, Lachlan War. The only true daily independent radio sports show in this country. Proudly presented by The Platform. You can listen to us live, one to four, every afternoon or... Next best thing, if you can't make that appointment, is this one, listening to the podcast. On the show today, Geordie Barrett is off for a six-month sabbatical. Leinster at season's end. Chris Jones all over that for us out of the UK. It's a big, big story, especially in Ireland. Black Ferns co-captain, Ruhe Demond, demanding that New Zealand rugby pay the players more, despite the fact that Quite clearly, the game here has not captured the public imagination like we were told that it would after the World Cup final in 2022. Where's this bottomless pit of money that New Zealand rugby has that, hey, you can demand and say, I I, I train hard, I work hard, I play hard, therefore I deserve to be paid. Tell that to all the journalists at the moment losing their jobs all over the media industry or anyone else that's sitting there thinking, yeah, I come to work, I deserve more money, but where does the money come from? You've got to have a product that people want to buy for a start. Mark Watson, ATM podcast number 79, is all over that. We went back to Wrexham, who, after being bought by superstars Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney, and the show, Welcome to Wrexham, well, they all of a sudden became global news. Promotion again was non-league into what used to be the old 4th Division League 2. Now they've jumped from League 2 into League 1. History making Wrexham. But is there some jealousy around this club? And what about all the other little Welsh football clubs that don't have the Hollywood superstars and all of their cash? Wales Online Tom Coleman joined us to talk about that. We tied five. We played What Is More Chance Are Happening? And also put on our PR hats to think now, if I was working for the NRL and I have to deal with this tail in May thing of speeding down suburban streets, giggling like a little schoolgirl, racing at almost 100k, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you make that go away? How do you spin that story? LBP, Matt Gunn, all over it. He reckons he has the answer. This is the podcast. It's called iOS, so it's only sport. And we start the show the same way every single day. Tablets in hand, I say gather my flock. It is time for a sermon. Let's talk honestly about the state of women's rugby in New Zealand. Let's go to the mountaintop. We live in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots. As New Zealand rugby continues to bog itself down in the quicksand of non-compromise over the board restructuring and recommendations of the Pilkington Review, the glaring question emerging from all the rugby over the weekend is still... Why has women's rugby in this country not kicked on like the National Association and the mainstream media organisations keep telling us that it has? Ramming it down at people's throats, demanding that rugby fans, sports fans, get interested in this product and watch it, festooning the sports media with talking heads and so-called experts, all telling us that it's the number one growth sport in the country, it's overtaking the men's game in popularity, etc., etc., all as witnessed by the zero crowd at Eden Park for the Opiki final on Saturday, a load of complete BS. Unless, of course, the TV figures were through the roof, but again, neither New Zealand Rugby nor Sky TV will ever reveal those. All they ever say and all they ever talk about is percentage increase this and download streaming on the rise that. The reality, though, was again clear and there for all to see. Less than two years after a sellout at the same venue for the Women's World Cup final, there were next to no spectators for the Opeki equivalent on Saturday. Here we are, April 2024, and no one is turning up to watch for many reasons. Number one, the scheduling was just dumb. 4 p.m. kickoff Saturday afternoon up against the Warriors on the first weekend of club rugby, simply prohibitive to the product. Two, the marketing and promotion of women's rugby in the last two years has failed, plain and simple. Talk about fan-centric fan engagement is just that, it's just talk. Three, dare I say it, the product isn't that good to watch? Uh, uh. Well, what say that is a reality? I'm just posing the question. Because if it was brilliant to watch, wouldn't there be many more thousands of people turning up to watch it? Number four, there has never been a business plan, a marketing plan, a strategic plan. Instead, what New Zealand Rugby did was hire six pathway managers, paying them huge salaries to write reports, attend meetings and write reports. It's like Jacinda and the Labour government. Have problem, hire consultant, write report. A lot of talking, a lot of telling off, but the crowds haven't exponentially increased at all. 
The reality here is the ratings are not through the roof. The game has not captured, despite us constantly being told it has, the public's imagination. We can all see it. The players know it. Eden Park was empty. New Zealand rugby and the mainstream media can try and sell it any which way they want. The truth, though, glaringly obvious, is that it is still clearly a fledgling, struggling, amateur, virtually invisible comp. Devlin. What do you want? We want information. Information. You won't get it. The platform. Lock it. Headlines, please. Yeah, I actually want to address a text that came in because I saw this article. Uh, is there a name on this text? No. Uh, Sumo Stevenson wrote a good article about how the NRL is killing Super Rugby. Finally, mainstream media are talking about this woeful Super Rugby shambles, blah, blah, blah. Yes, it's great to see. The only issue I have with it is that we and a few others, not many, probably not mainstream, have been talking about this for about a year and a uh-huh. half. Pretty much. I wrote an article. Actually, actually, it was within the first week or so of working here at the platform. It was early 2022. I wrote an article for the platform when I wrote stuff. Uh, and it was all about how the NRL is is just killing Super Rugby. And this is the sign of things to come. That was two years ago. Kind of, you know, trendsetter right here. Look at me. I'm one of the young kids. I've got all the words, all the terms. I'm rizzing it up. All right, it was a bit like last week when the New Zealand Herald and their rugby reporter, Liam Napier, decided to steal our story about Ian Foster yeah, without right. acknowledgement. You know, yeah, so, I mean, I, you know, the mainstream media, this is how they operate. I'm, you know... <laughs> Look, I don't care who gets the story first or who thinks they got the story first or who thinks they thought about it first. The reality is we all know what we're looking at, don't we? Mm. Geordie Barrett to talk about in a couple of minutes. Anyway. Um, yeah, apparently Geordie Barrett's decision... Now, this is how it's been written in One News, and I, I wouldn't say it's like this at all. Geordie Barrett's decision to sign for the All Blacks, Hurricanes and Taranaki until the end of 2028 has created a stir in Ireland, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. Make it known that, yes, he's re-signed with NZR until 2028, but he's going off to play for Leinster for six months. Now, I'm pretty sure that he'd floated that he was going to go overseas for a sabbatical at some point. We just didn't know where. So this has been confirmed. So it's not like we didn't know Jordy was doing this. We did know it. But anyway, apparently it's caused a bit of a stir in uh, Europe and the UK. People are losing their minds over the fact that Jordy Barrett, who they say is one of the best players in the world, and probably us too, is heading over to the UK. OK, just a little caveat on this. They've got a couple of centres at the moment, Leinster, who aren't too bad. Chris Jones is going to explain it in a second. Yeah. And, and they've just signed a Springbok, um, yeah, R.G. Snyman. Yeah, they've, actually got, they've actually got the Irish midfield pairing. Well, they've got the pretty much thir- they've got a starting 15 now of 13 Irish players, a Kiwi and a Safa, and the 13 Irish players, I'm pretty sure, are all in the Irish team. He's a great get, though, Geordie Barrett, let's be honest. About 5 oh, I mean, I think he's box office. Where, where I are think, they going to play think, him? I think people will want to watch if him they've got, If they've got the Irish midfield, does Geordie Barrett play a fullback? Well, they actually play about 20 or 30 games a year, unlike, you see, this is the other thing. I mean, Super Rugby, you only get to, you know, a certain amount of games you're allowed to play. I want to see our 30 or 40 best All Blacks go and play in the UK and France. I want that to happen. See how they go. I think they'll all become and better so, players. And South Africa, actually. Much better players. Of so, course. Good luck, Geordie. And that would actually help our domestic comp, give good us luck, a way to, to, to totally all that. Anyway, that's a uh, conversation for another time. Uh, an animated Ruahe de Mont has made a passionate plea for New Zealand rugby to throw more resources behind Super Rugby Opaki after reinforcing concerns about an onerous? That's onerous. 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 Excuse me. It's not a word I use much. Onerous workload for staff and players. Opaki is a really challenging setup. We get one day to train on a Thursday. If the competition was longer, it would give us an opportunity to be together for longer. New Zealand rugby needs to put more money into it so that players have the option to walk away from their jobs and we can get a full week's preparation. The same for our coaches as well. This is a media term that's similar to this. We probably a bunch of those, and not to, not to poke fun at, I'm not poking fun at News Hub, but a bunch of News Hub journos being told that, oh, we're losing money asking for a pay rise. That's what it kind of is. You're asking a whole lot of people who don't have any money to give you more money. Uh, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm very keen to know what you think about this, people. If you want to debate it, 0800 332283. It's, 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 to me, just a simple economic argument. That's all it is. Uh, the Reds will be without two of their very best for the next three weeks of Super Rugby Pacific. Uh, suspensions to Tate McDermott and Fraser McWright, both playing for the Wallabies. Uh, Wellington Phoenix have graduated New Zealand age grade international Gabriel Sloan Rodriguez. Into the first team signing the academy star to a three year deal through the 2026 27 A League season. Great story. This. Very good story. He's only, what, 16, I think he is? Yeah, he's 16. Not he's 17. 16. Yeah, brilliant story. Uh, Premier League this morning, one game on. Chelsea up against Everton, which would be a tricky one to pick typically, but Chelsea seem to have turned a bit of a corner. They're unbeaten in six games, I think, at least in the Premier League. Uh, 6 0, thumping Everton this morning. Cole Palmer scored four goals. I had him in my fantasy, so that's great. 
Uh, he scored four. Chelsea uh, only had about 14 shots in total. So whenever they did get in front of goal, they were prolific, efficient. Uh, they're sitting ninth on the table, though if Chelsea can win their game in hand on Man United, who is seventh, they go into seventh. Boy, what a season that would be if Man United finished behind Chelsea, given how Chelsea have started the year. Well, did start the year. Uh, New Zealand's Elise Andrews, cyclist, has completed a triumphant return from injury, winning gold in the Women's Kieran at the Nation, uh, uh, Nations Cup excuse me, track cycling meet in Canada. Uh, American heavyweight boxer Deontay Wilder has signed with Matchroom Boxing and will face Gilles Zhang as part of the 5 versus 5 card against Queensbury Promotions in early June in Saudi Arabia. Caitlin Clark admitted she was a little bit nervous before being chosen with the number one pick in the WNBA draft by the Indiana Fever. That was today. Uh, I don't know why she was nervous. It shouldn't have been much surprise. Uh, da, 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 da. Not much else going on. That's what's making news, Martin. Devlin. That is a disgusting act. The platform. Jordy Barrett is off to Leinster. Six months sabbatical after this season ends, after the international season ends. Well spun this story today in their PR release by New Zealand Rugby because the headline was Geordie Barrett is re-signed for New Zealand Rugby after the 2027 Rugby World Cup. The fine print, oh hang on, oh just another All Black superstar who won't be playing Super Rugby next year. Chris Jones on this, out of the UK. He won't be seeing him for six months and while others will be having a mandatory stand down, uh, he'll be uh, being flogged to death by Leinster, getting their money out of him. But uh, I tell you what, he better bring his wallet with him because uh, I tell you, a night out in Dublin these days, 10 euros a pint, I'd stay away from Temple Bar if I was him. So Leinster, tell us about this club. Well, they they are the powerhouse of uh, of Irish rugby, and they want to be the powerhouse of European rugby. But they kept on running into La Rochelle in recent seasons and having the Champions Cup ripped away from them. But of course, they beat La Rochelle this weekend. Uh, you would have to say that they have some very very uh, strong friends in very high places because they seem to play every single important match in Dublin, and sure enough, they're going to play their semi final there as well. So. Uh, if they don't win it this year, because, you know, the final's only going to be over in uh, in London, there, so they haven't got very far to travel. It'll be probably, if they win the, the the Champions Cup, they would have traveled the least distance of any winning team, and that will really stick in the craw of the South Africans. So he signed for six months um, after he finishes his New Zealand commitments for this year. So that's after the end of season tour. So that all wraps up in November. Does So does he does he basically just stay over there and, and keep playing? When is the season exactly? He will just keep playing, and uh, and within sort of a month of him being here, he'll be playing Champions League rugby, either defending the cup that uh, that Leinster have won, or trying to uh, help them achieve what they really want to achieve, which is why they've made all these big name signings. You know, they're not exactly short of centres. You know, they have a couple called you may have heard of them, uh, Robbie Henshaw and Gary Ringrose, right? Uh, yes, probably yes. The Irish centres. You know, so you know, and then and, and Nagatai's there as well. So they're not exactly short of midfield players but of course he's such a fantastic name that uh, it will attract even more attention you know they play at the the, the Dublin showground but they play more and more of these games at the Aviva and I tell you what if they do get even more support which this is liable to bring them because he's such a big name that uh, it's a money spinner for them and uh, you know Leinster are funded by the Irish Rugby Football Union so this would have gone uh, through right at the highest level Uh, it won't um, make the other provinces that happy. Poor Connaught, always the poor relation, but they just keep on punching. Uh, you know, the arch rivals, Munster, and of course, Ulster. But uh, Leinster have found the money to bring Geordie over. Well done on them. What kind, what kind of splash has this made in news, your part of the world, rugby news? Oh, well, it just uh, it actually lit up Twitter massively. And it's, uh, it's a hell of a coup. You know, if you're going to get... Uh, uh, a New Zealand uh, uh, player, then Geordie's right up there, isn't he? I mean, he's been so important in that midfield. He's made that centre position his own. Uh, he, you know, he's he's a he's a lovely play. He can he can change a game, and he, you know, he's he's a good image for the sport, isn't he? Because you know he's part of the family, and he's really talking up that Irish oh, uh, is he what? connection yeah, already. The connection. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I should think he'll be having a shamrock tattooed on his backside as we speak, <laughs> uh, just to sort of. Just to fit in completely, but boy, is he is he milking that bit about you know, re, you know county meath meeting up with the old, with, meeting up with all the old folks. It'll be brilliant, and no doubt when when he arrives, he'll find there's about three thousand other relatives he never knew he had. 
Chris Jones, Rugby Pass Time, Times Online with us. I'm always amused, actually, I am. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I used to get very cynical about it, but now I'm always amused at how creative uh, they are in the PR department writing around this. Like, you know, when you go to Japan, it's just like, I've always been in love with sushi. You know, I've, I've had a fascination with sumo wrestling. I just want to indulge in the culture and everything else. I would like to actually tabulate at some stage all the players that have gone over there that have done anything other than turn up for training, get really well paid and hang out with their English speaking teammates. But that's just an aside. I mean, they've got to sell the story, don't they? And and and, and I think this one has been sold really well. Absolutely. And they've got him saying the right things. He wants to grow his game. Uh, excuse me. Isn't he already one of the world's best centres? Which bit of his game is he going to be growing? It'll be nice for him to listen to a World Cup winning South African coach uh, coaching uh, Leinster as well. That could be quite interesting for him as well. Maybe he'll get a, a bit of better insight into, into uh, how the box uh, set themselves up and why they've been so successful in, in recent World Cups. But, uh, hey, that's just an added bonus to the whole thing because, of course, it is all about becoming a better player, maybe a better person, maybe a better drinker. It, all these things are open to him in Dublin. And in terms of uh, yeah, improving as a player, exactly. I mean, is, is, is there any yardstick that, that, that we can use and say, oh, yes, this guy's come over from somewhere and then he's demonstrably better after spending a few months playing in another competition? Is there, is there, is there any names that spring to mind about this? Uh, no, not really, because it takes them a bit of time to get used to the system for a start. You know, I can't think of players who've just been so good they walked into a team and the team has suddenly grown around them. You, you, maybe before, before we, when we just started at, uh, you know, professional re- rugby here, when you had uh, Inga Tugamala suddenly went to Newcastle and, and wow, what an impact he made. Or Pat Lamb going to North Northampton because, you know, you had players who were ostensibly professional in their outlook, joining teams that were just becoming professional. It's very different now. The, the, the operation that Geordie's joining in Leinster is world class. It is basically the Irish international team playing in blue. And so, therefore, when he steps onto that pitch, he's not going to stand head and shoulders in, in talent above the people either side of him because they are currently yeah, in a team that, yeah, that, that has been beating most t- other teams in the world, including New Zealand in their own backyard, I must remind you. So, therefore, he might learn a few things. But I'm not sure it's going to be in a situation when he's going to turn Leinster around and suddenly make them an even better team because they are one of the top two or three teams, club teams in the world at the moment. We need to talk. We've got to play a game, Lockham. We We're going to play a game. need to talk. It's called What Is More Chance Are Happening. Yes. I present two scenarios and you tell me out of the two what is more chance are happening and we're concentrating on the Super Rugby competition. Yes. What is more chance are happening, Lachlan? The Black Caps, seriously under strength, win the five-match T20 series versus Pakistan starting this Friday. I mean, Lord Almighty, does anyone even know that that's on? I have no idea. It's starting this what? Friday. Does anyone, even know, does anyone even know that it's on? The Black Caps win the five-match T20 series versus Pakistan, or the Rebels, who are currently sitting on the table in fourth, make the playoffs. Yes. What is more chance of happening? Is it a way to Pakistan? Of course it is. Um, our Rebels make the playoffs. They're in the box set as it is. 24 points last year got you in. They play six... Well, they've got 24 right now. They've played... Uh, they've got six games to go. They're five and three. Th- Schedule doesn't You'd look good, though. They've got the Crusaders, the Blues, the Chiefs, the well, Brumbies, and away the Indians. Well, starters. The Crusaders now, um, I, I'm off the wagon. Okay. I, I'm yes. not a fan anymore. That's the second one, then. What is more chance of happening? We beat Pakistan across five T20s. That means we've got to win at least three of them. Or the Crusaders will still we make, make... We beat Pakistan. No, the Crusaders... I'm all will... off. No, I'm off. You had a chance. I'm sorry, Crusaders. You had your chance, all right? You should have won that game, and you threw it away. Now, granted, they threw it away by a brain fart from Rives Rayhana, their backup first five who I actually still really like as a player. But you still lost it. I can't believe even now I'm flabbing. How dumb are you that you don't know the rules? The referee explained to you. You don't have to kick the ball. I know the referee said it to him. You don't have to kick... But... I mean, okay, he's 24 years old. He's playing for the Crusaders. He's in the first five job. He, he's, you know, his mind's probably going at a thousand miles. Down. What, what do you mean I don't have to kick it? I've got to kick the conversion. I've got to, he's probably only thinking about that. I mean, you know, you've got 60 seconds to do it. It's 79 36. Also, I mean, you don't have to take the kick, mate. You're up by three. You don't have to. No, he's up by one because that took them to three points, all right? That, Did he get the kick? He got the kick, took oh, okay. them to, to three points, and then 
New South Wales came back and then because there was an intercept and an attempt I, I, they got I, the I, I don't think a racing head or nerves or anything should deter you from looking at the clock and going okay it's Nick Foley all over again, mate. 40, is what it 30, is. 40 seconds. The refs told you five times, kick the ball out. Kick the ball out. Kick yeah. it, the ball, the out. Well, too, I mean, there was... Well, a, that's a bit German. No, no, ho- yeah, I was gonna, <laughs> Sorry. hold up. The, the Bernard Foley one, he was only told twice, I think. Granted. He was told 19 times, Locker. Next! Story oh, grows. Gosh. What is more chance of happening? We win the five-match T20 series... Or the Hurricanes finished top of the table in Super Rugby. Hurricanes finished top Hurricanes of the table. Hurricanes finished top of the table. Next! That was it. What is more chance of happening? The Black Caps ahead of the T20 World Cup in this crucially, crucial, vitally vital T20 series against Pakistan. How many, how many of our key players aren't playing? Well, you read down the team sheet and tell me how many you recognise, right? Or <laughs> the Highlanders get the wooden spoon. What is more chance of happening? The Force... The force back, well, the force and the Highlanders play in two weeks. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's the wooden spoon match right there. It probably is. It's in and the Highlanders have to win that. They've got to win that one, don't they? Please. They'll Lord. probably, well, they'll beat the Reds because the Reds don't have two of their best players. They'll, they'll beat the Reds, I think. I'm not confident the Highlanders beating anyone at the moment. Uh, and they'll beat the force. No, I, I, don't think, I don't think they'll. And they've, right. got, mate, they've got Moana Pacifica. They're right, a better next. team than okay. Moana Pacifica. What is more chance of happening then? We win this T20 meaningless series against Pakistan or the Force only win one game all season and they've won it already. They And you know who they beat? They beat the, the Reds. That's right. Uh, the Force have... Hold up, I had their schedule. Let me go back to their schedule. Okay. The Force have the Crusaders. Well... They're not going to win that uh, game, mate. The Crusaders lost They're to the Waratahs. The four, the four, the four. Who, and to that point, had only won a game, and that was against the Crusaders. The Force aren't. Let me just put a full stop at the end of that. They're not a Force, are they? I think they could beat the Crusaders. It's in Perth. So, what is more chance of happening? What was the question again? The Force only win one game all season. No. Yes. I reckon they win more than one. What is more chance of happening? The Black Caps barnstorm the five match series, of which we'll be watching every five, minute. Every. Five, five. I mean, God, you can't be more bored in if your it's life. It's a warm up series. Can't we have one? <laughs> or Three? the Blues don't make the final of Super Rugby. I don't even think we played five T20s at the last one. The Cup. Blues don't make the final. They will make the. Finals. They won't make the, the, the final. The look. final. Okay, well, as a st- so uh, the table's probably going to finish Hurricanes, Blues, Chiefs, right? The Blues have got to win two playoff games to make the final. Well, they're probably going to have a home quarter and oh, well, semi. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a huge advantage for them, isn't it? Because they're tough at home. See, this is your issue. You're viewing the Blues the same way that you're viewing uh, pretty much any team the in the blues. NBA right now. No, the Blues. I'm viewing the Blues. It's a different coach. Viewing. They're a different team. They're a different They're team. rejuvenated. All right. What is more chance of happening then? Um, the Blues uh, make the final. Mm, two yes. to go before the news. What is more chance of happening? I, don't, I mean, the Black... I'm the, is anyone going to watch any of this? No. Because it's in the middle of the night for a start. Okay, we win the t- five-match T20 series against Pakistan or the Brumbies make the top four. They're third at the moment. Yes, the Brumbies okay. make the top four. Yes. Final one then. Oh, hold up. Oh, no, because it, it would involve... Them or the Rebels dropping out if the Chiefs get in there. Yeah, okay. And I think there's more chance the Rebels right. drop out. So. All right. Final one, then. We win the five-match T20 series versus Pakistan, kicking off on Friday. Or the Andrua win a game away from home. Have they not already? No. They've, They've won, won three. three. All of them have been at home. They're home to the Canes. They're home to MP. They're away the Brumbies. They're away the Force. They're away the Highlanders. They'll beat the Highlanders. And they'll probably they don't the win. Force. A, they don't win away from home. Well, they'll beat the Highlanders with the force. They're better than them. Well, maybe not the Highlanders. I don't know. See, this is as soon as you put a little bit of doubt in that mind, don't you? I yeah. think I think they win one of those two. <laughs> two o'clock it is, ladies and gentlemen. This is the plaid for Martin Devlin, Lachlan War iOS. It's only sport. Mark Watto Watson will join us. ATM podcast episode seventy nine. Apologise to me. We're going to talk about Geordie Barrett. We're going to talk about Rohe Damon, and we're going to talk about. The school kids water polo tournament that Watto is in Wellington at the moment calling and commentating. You you want athletes? You want commitment to a sport? Have a game of that. See how long you last. The women wear two pairs of knickers while they're actually playing that. Did you know that? They have to wear two pairs of togs. Why? 
Well, because underwater, mate, she's a... There's a... Well, you'd have an issue if you were playing mix because then all the boys would just be underwater. They'd just be staring, wouldn't they? Well, maybe all the girls would be underwater staring, Lachlan. Oh, yeah. Okay, maybe that is... Actually, no, they'd be underwater laughing because, hey, George Costanza. <laughs> Cold water. <laughs> we all want to get paid more, don't we? We all go to work, we all work hard, we all want to get paid more. However... The way that the economic system works is you have to sell something. You have to have something that people want to buy. Ruhe Demont, Black Ferns co-captain, demanding from New Zealand rugby that all of the Opiki players get paid more because some of them have to have part-time jobs and some of them are working seven days a week for 12 weeks and some of them are mothers. And, and, and this all, 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 all sounds very worthy, but does New Zealand rugby have a bottomless pit of cash to continue to fund and subsidise this part of the game, which clearly is not growing in the way that we were all told it was going to after the 22 World Cup final. I mean, you know, everyone has a wish list and Ruhe Demont, good on you for having yours. But where does the money come from? And why should anyone else pay when what you are selling, no one is buying? Mark Watson, the ATM podcast, episode 79. His thoughts. Ruhe Demont comments, and it's in a stuff article today. And the interesting thing to me was that right at the very end of the article, the very last paragraph says, uh, Super Rugby Opiki has not captured the public's imagination. There has been no growth since the 2022 Rugby World Cup. Well, how long has it taken for that organisation to actually accept reality? You and me have been saying this since the World Cup final in October, that the next challenge for New Zealand rugby was to somehow capture that audience and continue with that audience, and they haven't. They failed. They failed the women completely. All they did was hire six high-performance managers who just sit there writing reports back and forth to each other, but there has actually been no growth. Mark and I want to talk about Ruhe's comments because you know to me it's like I sit in my job you sit in your job I want more money I want a higher salary I want a reward for the hard work that I put in and I work my butt off for this organization mm. but unless there is money coming through the door I don't get paid I just wonder where the self-entitlement comes from you know it, maybe it was the Labour government which has just basically convinced everyone that if you want something you just put your hand out and the taxpayer will pay for it you know Ruhe the economic reality is you've got to have something to sell you've got to have a customer base and your product isn't getting that at the moment. Now you can go through a myriad of reasons for this and maybe one of them is because it's not that great to look at and people don't want to watch it. Well, what say that's a reality and a truth? You can't just sit there to New Zealand rugby the whole time and say give us more money. There is no more goddamn money. You've got to go out and find that money. No, no look, but I think I go back to the media and I go back to those um, left wing and I will call them strong feminists who I think have an agenda and they've, they, they've tapped into the woke world over the last six years under the previous Labour government and they've manipulated the environment and they've actually told these women that play rugby, you are the same as the Blues men. You are the same as the All Blacks. And, and, and you know, they've elevated their sense of self-importance. They've, you know, you see it with the women cricketers. You see it with the women's football team. And the reality is both all of those sports, not so much women's football, because I think it is a big sport at grassroots level, but a lot of those other sports are, min are minor sports, just, just somehow believing that, you know, we're entitled, you know, it took 120, 130 years to build men's rugby, et cetera. And so, we're, you know, we're automatically entitled to be alongside of them. We're elite athletes. And they're not. They're club athletes. Um, you know, uh, you know me, Martin. Look, I've spent my whole life around endurance athletes. I've seen guys who have just found a way to go overseas and chase the various running dreams, the triathlon dreams, whatever it is. Huge hours, huge volumes of training, mate. I'd never, ever heard any of them putting their hand out saying, I need to get paid from the government. I need to get paid by the body. They're doing it because they love it. Uh, you know, the, oh, we don't have enough time to train. Rubbish. You're playing four games in seven weeks of competition. I... I was down at, I think it was the College Rifles ground one night, and Willie Walker was down there with the Blues team, and I was just curious. I mean, seriously, the level of training that these guys were putting in is laughable. Then you look at somebody like Erica Fairweather. You go back to the days of the Erin Bakers. These guys don't complain. They train 10 times harder. They're more professional than any women's rugby player in this country. And how is it the media with this agenda, always seem to go in and back the women cricketers and the women rugby players to get paid more. Why are they not out there advocating for our individual endurance athletes? I'll tell you why. Because they're bloody ignorant of them because they haven't done their homework. But, you know, at the same time, constantly preach equity, but yet actually don't give those other women athletes in much tougher sports actually any level of equity at all in terms of the coverage they get. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. 
the tight all five. you need to know. All you need to know. Five separate sporting topics, 60 seconds or thereabouts on each topic. When the bell, mm, we go on to the next topic. Jordy Barrett's going to miss the 2025 Super Rugby season. Um, but he is the first All Black to re-sign beyond the next Rugby World Cup. What do you think about this, lot? Chelsea 6, Everton nil. Everton right back in the relegation scrap. The US track and field athletic costumes for the women at the Paris Olympics raising some ire. Well, it's just, it's the kind of article that you expect an organisation like Stuff to plaster all over it. Of course, accusing everyone involved of being... Santa's pig! However, the sidebar to this, which isn't as well reported in their article, is that the female US track athletes that they asked have said, we don't mind the skimpy outfits and there's 20 different variances involved in this and we can wear the men's outfits if we want anyway. So if we choose to wear those outfits, who the hell are you to tell us that we shouldn't wear them? I really like that attitude. Uh, white pants. Can we just establish a rule that men should not wear white pants? Shorts maybe, but not long. That's aimed at you, Leo Malloy. The caver who lasted 500 days in isolation. We're going to celebrate this in half an hour. This happened last year. A Spanish woman spent 500 days in isolation, set some kind of world isolation record. Who even knew there was one? Aaron Rodgers. He did it for four days, remember, Lachlan? Ruhe de Mont. Do you think that Ruhe has a point or is this just self-entitlement from our female rugby players who uh, either have a really good point they're making or are just misreading an ec economic situation, which is very simple, and they come on in on the wrong side of the ledger of that equation. Michael Jordan played his last game ever of NBA today. We'll celebrate that in our historical moment before 3 o'clock. Uh, it wasn't really the Michael Jordan that was the superstar. Michael Jordan he was playing for the Wizards against Philadelphia, the 76ers. He got a three-minute standing ovation. Jordy Barrett to start with. You know, I, I just think this is the norm now. This is a super rugby, struggling as a product, and our leading All Blacks just don't want to play. I, I, I think that's clear, isn't it? For whatever reason, they don't want to play. It's not exciting enough. Maybe it's too tough for them. Um, they get paid well enough anyway, but obviously they get more money playing in Japan or in Geordie's case, going to Leinster. I, I, you know, this horse bolted <clears throat> when Dan Carter was the first back in 09, wasn't it? Was it 09 where he went to a French club, did his yep. Achilles or something? 09. Perpignan. Um, there you go. And we've had the sabbaticals um, and it's absolutely necessary keeping players here, blah, 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 all of that kind of stuff. What's also absolutely necessary in New Zealand rugby, and this is the point you seem to be missing, is that this competition needs its superstars. Now, do remember, let's track back to Super Rugby Round in Melbourne, second round of the comp. And what was the big headline that day? It was Blues players, including Rico and oh, Christy, yeah. rested on all black duty, right? Yeah. So this is a competition that is struggling for eyeballs, struggling to get people interested in it, and cons constantly the best players are leaving to play other competitions. And the powers that be are powerless, Lachlan, to stop this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you just, just think about this in NRL terms. Pick out your three favourite Warriors aren't going to be playing uh, the first part of next year because they'd rather go and play in a European competition Well, somewhere. it just wouldn't happen. It's not going to happen, no. is it? It's not going to happen. But it's... Um, no it, other sport it, in the world allows this. It just seems to be the power of the players association. That's exactly well, what they it they implement to contracts and whatnot. You know, and you know? guess who suffers? Dumb old us. Who are asked to continually turn up to the grounds, which we're not doing, continually watch it on TV. You know, this competition is dying. Mm. And the thing that keeps it alive are the players that you want to go along and watch. Yeah, agreed. And these guys aren't going to be there in increasing numbers. Aruhe Demont, let's talk about this because we're going to uh, ask Watto all about this and I want his take on this as well. I'm not heaping on women's rugby, I'm not dumping on this player at all, yes, but sure. I just think that some reality needs to be added to this situation and I wish somebody from New Zealand rugby would come out and do that, but of course they won't. So what New Zealand rugby did after October 2022 and the Women's World Cup final was they employed six high-performance pathway creation managers. Yeah. And since that time, locked in, all of these women that they employed, they're all women, uh, all on big six-figure salaries. Question for you. Have crowds increased in the domestic product and the game since that time? 
No. Have television audiences increased in the domestic product and the game since that time? No, I don't have exact numbers, of course. I'm just assuming. Yeah, well, there's um, been percentage increases, yeah, Lachlan. Percentage, yeah, 17% bump up in that's the right, 10 years. That's right. Yeah, so what, there's now 17? Yeah. Um, what we know, and what we know, all of us know, including the players, is that they're playing to empty stadiums. We know that, right? Look, there could be a minor increase in terms of the crowds and TV viewers, but it's nowhere near big enough to no, we warrant... Were, we were told that this was the biggest growth sport in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? We've been fed this line for the best part of two years. And we've also been asked by the players, which is fair enough at the time, you know, turn up, come watch. Support you know, we our need product. Support our product. Yeah. We need the fans. Yeah. Um, by I, a lot look, of the players I, during the World Cup. I absolutely point the finger at New Zealand rugby here. I've been saying it for well, two years. You've got no marketing plan. You've got no business plan. You've got no strategic plan. Employing a whole lot of women to write reports and go to meetings isn't attracting people to your game. How are you going to get people to your game? And these are the most basic questions, marketing questions you ask. Who do you want as your audience? What is that audience currently doing? Why is that audience not turning up yeah, to Now, your... that's a good point. The thing is, you want an audience... There's two things. Just these two th Quickly, I, I, I want to make one point clear, and I and this could get lost in translation. We're not having a crack at Ruhe de Mont. Not at all. We're I not like having her a crack as a player. The I love her as a player, as a matter of fact. It gets a little bit frustrating when a lot of the women's players come out and say this because it feels obvious why you haven't got fans. If, well, there at least feels to be a very obvious reason, same reason why when I'm watching sports on a Saturday or a Sunday, I'm watching a man's sport instead of women's sport. I'm being honest, I just enjoy it more. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot of people. Well, most sports yeah. fans in this country feel the same way. Yeah. Um, but... Um, you, what did you say? You said something just now that jogged my memory. What were you talking about just now? You are talking about something that jogged my memory. Well, I was just saying that I think it's the failure of New Zealand rugby. There's no marketing plan. There's no strategic plan. There's no business plan. All they've done is employ a whole lot of managers. Mm. I mean, this is how the Labor government operated for six years. Problem, hire a consultant. And that's all New Zealand rugby have done. And that's what Mark Robinson is about. Hire a consultant. Oh, look, we've got six pathway managers here for women's rugby. There we go. You jogged my memory. You talked about the audience. Um, and you talk about it a lot with radio as well, like you, you're playing to your audience whatnot. They need to find who their audience is. Who do you want to be your fans? Because they clearly want a specific portion of society because look at what the Hurricanes poll just did with their hucker. They yeah. had a crack at a certain group of society. Well, you clearly don't want them as your fans. No, not at all. So who do you want? Who do you want? You want what? Hypothetically, hypothetically speaking, you want young, uh, teenage, early 20s women. Great, go and find a way to attract them okay, to your product. So what are they doing right now? Yeah. On a Saturday afternoon, when the Opeki final on, yeah. who are those Sunday people? Hours, what are they doing? What are they doing? Yeah. Why are they coming to what your game? What ticks their boxes That's it. for entertainment when they're not at work? Yeah, and this is just qualitative research. Yeah, and I just, I'm just i flabbergasted that an organisation that earns hundreds of millions of dollars is incapable of bridging this gap, of answering this equation. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about Chelsea. Mate, they're on a roll at the moment. 6-0 over Everton. This guy, Cole Palmer, four goals. I mean, he's they're going to overtake us. He's had us. a really good year. He they're going to overtake should, you guys. He should, no, he's no, Aren't not. they? Stop. Oh, sorry. You're sliding down the table. Statistically, I don't think they can, actually. Oh, yeah, okay. Because well, you've, you've got a lot of balls to say that when you look at how that. rubbish your Listen, team is. I tell you what, you've dropped four points against us this year. You'd be top of the table without it. I've got something to say now, okay? You haven't beaten us all season. I've got something to say now. Hmm. You lost at home to Crystal Palace. I got something to say now. Oh, who did you lose? Uh, you lost 3-0 at home yeah, to Yeah, but that's, up, that's us, mate. I mean, we're, we're not... Well, no, 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 whoppy, whoppy, well, whoppy, well, whoppy on well, the farewell neither tour. Us, now, shut up. Neither are we. Don't say that. On the main street of Liverpool. Don't say that. I will say this. In my defence, and, and I'd like to think you could attest to this, I haven't all season said that we're winning the league or we should be favourites to win it. Because at the start of the season... Top four and a good run in one of the Cups or the Europa League is what I'm after. That's what I said at the start of the season. We're in the top four. We've already locked in a Champions League spot. We won the League Cup. I'm happy with that. Now, granted, I'm not happy with the fact that we were top of the table by about four or five points in January and now have lost that lead. That sucks. But... I don't know. It's not like we're Man United at 2012 who had an eight-point oh, lead or God, something. Why, was you're it? Ready. Why are you so nasty? Why are you so nasty <laughs> about my team? Dickhead. Uh, two to go. The US track and field athletes... I'm so glad that the women involved in this that are going to go and represent the United States and try them in gold medals in Paris, the ones that they asked have turned around and said, how dare you attack us for wearing these uniforms? You think they're skimpy or you think there's something wrong with them. I've chosen to wear it. Now, a lot of female athletes are really proud of their bodies, mm. right? And they like to show their bodies off. They're goddamn hot. They're fit, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that's the truth. So... That I'm sounds sorry. a bit weird coming out of your mouth. Well, it's just, I'm sorry, but that bikini is sexist and you shouldn't wear it. 
Well, you ask the woman who looks like a supermodel wearing that bikini whether she wants to wear that bikini. Mm. Shut up and stop telling people uh, off and telling them uh, what to do. I tell you what, I think it's a very fair point. And I think it's... Um, well, I mean, if I raise this, I'm a sexist pig, but when the female athletes raise this, it's actually valid, isn't it? Yeah. So you, whoever you journalists are, stop telling me what to wear. I can wear this or wear nothing. It's my choice, right? Yeah. You'll get you'll get a certain portion, and it's people who are typically my age, and you know which political party they vote for, and you know how little they shave, and then they'll say things <laughs> like... <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's the truth, it's ladies the and truth. gentlemen, isn't it's it? It's the truth. You, they'll say they're things angry like... angry and they're hairy. Yeah, Those are the people that object these, to this. These women are being objectified, sexualised. How dare society do this? And it's just a girl saying, actually, I like how I look. I, I just like want to wear, yeah, wear a bikini right. and put that picture yeah. on my Instagram. What's what? wrong with that? And the AFL players in singlets and little tidy tight yeah. undie shorts well, are sexualised and Brisbane, objectified. Who was the Brisbane Lions player who had his singlet ripped in a game last year and had this... Pretty damn good rig, and he had this flowing surfy kind of hair, and his Instagram following like tripled in Tri- a day. Uh, right, remember that? Finally, Michael Jordan retired from the court today. Uh, it was in was 2000. His third retirement. Two thousand three, three or something like that. I think it was. Um, we're going to celebrate that in history, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah, it was two thousand and three. Played his last game. Look, don't don't go and search this on YouTube. If you're going to search Michael Jordan, search for when he was the absolute beast that he was for the Chicago, Chicago Bulls or watch The Last Dance. But I just thought it was significant to mark the moment. We will, we will, because, I mean, this guy... I mean, you watch a lot more basketball than me these days, but I'm so glad that I was around and, and, and watching at a time when he was winning his titles. And I watched every single series of every one of those titles from 1991 onwards. Is and, it? mate, I was in the States in 93 with her, and wherever we were, we had to end up at a bar. Yeah. to watch those games. Oh, look, I just adored this guy on the bar. Look, to me, it was like being alive to watch Muhammad Ali box, uh, to watch Tiger Woods play in his pomp. Uh, I never saw Pelé play, okay? Because 1970 was his last game for Brazil and obviously he was only a few years old at that stage. But, you know, this is, you know, the, these are the greatest people that have ever played, amongst the greatest that have ever played sport. Yeah, it feels like, uh, I was actually listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about and they'll talk about Kayla Clark in a sense, which is very fair when you look at the, what she's done in the US. And they're talking about athletes who have picked up a sport and pushed it up, essentially. And they talked about... Um, the way they talk about Michael Jordan, and I obviously wasn't... Um, I, was only, I, was, I was born the very end of his second Bulls tenure. Um, it just sounds like that that was prime-time viewing. Even if you weren't yeah, a fan of the Bulls. Totally if you're a fan of the Bucks, the Pacers, the Pistons, teams that hated them... You Next, still yeah. watch you Michael still Jordan, yeah, and it just doesn't. There well, doesn't there's, a basketball, there's, there's, there's not that anymore. I've never. I don't. I don't know of a player. The only th- person I can think of that's like that is probably Messi. You know, LeBron James isn't like that. No, I mean, you're right. LeBron's a, a, a freak of nature and he's so popular. But pe- I don't think people like you know circle the calendar for when yeah. he's playing Go every, every day of the week. Yeah, you just know? to they watch don't this guy play. Devlin. Welcome to Wrexham. It's a TV show. It's a football club. Hollywood superstars and their cash are all behind it. And last year capturing global headlines because Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney were on the pitch drinking champagne and being Wrexham football fans. Well, they weren't there this time when the club got another promotion, but equally exciting for the people of Wrexham in Wales. Wales online correspondent Tom Coleman reporting for us. Now promotion to League One. How have people reacted to this? Um. Well, I think it's been... It's been one of the stories of Welsh sport, hasn't it? Really, I think um, the scenes that we saw on Saturday were—I um, wouldn't say unprecedented, but uh, I think it's the first time that Wrexham got to the third tier since 2005, I believe. So, um, you know, this is um, this has been a moment that I think a lot of Wrexham fans probably almost felt that they'd never kind of see again, really, because. Um, languishing in the National League, which is obviously the league outside of the EFL for so long. Um, um, and obviously the takeover happened and the momentum of that just keeps going on and on and on and on. And, you know, I think um, I think the general feeling amongst Wrexham fans is that, uh, you know, this is a club that's going, This is well, this is merely one more step on, on a much wider and more special journey. Yeah, where does this end? I mean, it's just, you know, there have been rags to riches stories of clubs. I think Luton Town did, did it most recently, actually, of going from what we used to call the fourth division all the way through. Is that the ambition? I mean, do these guys want this club? Is this reality that they could play Premier League again? 
Um, well, I think that's, I mean, that's very difficult to say at this stage for a few reasons. I mean, the, the owners have, have mentioned that they would like to get to the Premier League. Um, but as, as ever with folks like Ryan Reynolds, it's, it's sometimes difficult to, to, <laughs> to tell when he's being tongue in cheek or not. But, um, you know, I think the Premier League has to be the ultimate ambition. But a few, there's a few things that, that will need to, to happen for that. I mean, first of all, um, I, I, I think the gap from League Two to League One is a much, much bigger one than the National League to League Two. So I think you know, consolidation in League One next season, I think, would represent a good campaign for them. But then the step up to the Championship again is very, very hard. Um, last few teams that have come up from League One in the Championship have struggled. Um, although, admittedly, they, they don't have the financial muscle of Wrexham. Um, but there's other things as well. I think, you know, the infrastructure... Um, I mean, the, the the race course is obviously an iconic football ground in, in Welsh football, but I think is due a pretty significant expansion. Um, they're probably going to have to, uh, I, I hate using this phrase because it's such, such sort of business speak, but diversify their kind of revenue streams. Um, you know, financial fair play is something that is catching out clubs left, right and centre, as I'm sure you guys are well aware of with all the stuff that's going yeah, on with yeah. Everton and Nottingham Forest and the Premier League. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff to navigate before before they even start thinking about the Premier League. But I think they'll take it one step at a time. And you've got to say that with Hollywood backing, um, the, the, the amount of imagination that's captured with the, with the, with the documentary and everything, you know, there's, there's no reason why they shouldn't start at least dreaming about it. But, you know, I think a lot of Wrexham fans at the moment are just, are just enjoying the moment um, simply because, you know, so many remember where they remember where they were. I don't, I'm not sure Luton is a great comparison, to be honest, because, you know, Luton, I, I mean, they didn't, they didn't have anywhere near the sort of financial muscle that Wrexham have got. So you would actually argue that Wrexham have probably got a better chance than Luton did of, of doing it. Um, Luton, though, they're just an example of a very, very well-run club doing things um, consistently, consistently bang on for season after season. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff that will need to happen. There's a few things that will need to happen even this summer um a few players that will probably move on um there's quite a few aging stars in that team now uh, a few question marks over, over over certain positions but yeah i don't to be honest i don't think rex of fans will probably be thinking about that right now i think they're just going to be uh, i think they're just going to be enjoying the last few games and uh, and i strongly suspect a few more beers as well a couple of quick questions we'll let you go. Tom Common, Wells Online with us. Is there any jealousy amongst the other clubs? Because this it becomes the haves and have nots eventually. I mean, if you're sitting there and you know you're one of the ones that aren't actually, you know, getting the Hollywood cash and everything else, I mean, is there a little bit of bitterness about that or not? Oh, God, absolutely. I think it, uh, even without the Hollywood thing, I think if you're a team that everyone's talking about, you immediately become a team that everyone wants to beat. Um, to be honest, I think a lot of the um, jealousy has actually come from fans of other Welsh clubs, um, because you know, especially especially the you know the likes of Cardiff City, Swansea, Newport, you know, clubs that you know have been kind of part of the established order of Welsh football for some time. I mean, Wrexham have obviously overtaken Newport now in terms of their league standing. Um, Cardiff and Swansea are still the two biggest clubs, um, but probably don't get anywhere near the kind of global coverage that Wrexham do and I think that sticks in the back teeth for quite quite a few fans of, of Cardiff and Swansea bear, bear in mind that you know we're talking about two former Premier League teams mm, here mm. so yeah I think there is a bit of jealousy um, I think you know the the, the 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 stuff around the documentary I think people have people have perhaps got a little bit um got a little bit jealous of but I think on the whole um, a lot of people in Wales are just happy that Wrexham and indeed the documentary and the work done by Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney is putting the country on the map in a positive light and you know that can only be that can only be a good thing for, for Wales as a whole I work for the NRL. Well, I don't, but I just put this hat on today and thought, now, if I'm defending Taylor and May, racing down suburban streets in a car at almost 100k, really dangerous, and then putting it on social media, <laughs> how do you defend this idiocy, this stupidity? If you are working PR for the NRL, how do you paint that in any way at all which is going to make the goon that did it look good or 
somehow pivot and divert people's attention away from just another rugby league player doing something really dumb on their day off. LBP, let's be positive. Matt Gunn thinks he's got the spin. Let's finish on being a PR consultant or working in the communications department for the NRL. And look, the good thing, I suppose, is that you're busy, aren't you? And you've always got a hell of a lot of work to do. Um, yeah, that's one positive. And we are keeping it positive. But when you get a guy like Taylor May, now, this is the guy who tried to take Reese Walsh's head off, uh, you know, with his own head a few weeks back. And he actually, there's no punishment for that. And it, he actually should have gone for a skate for five or six weeks for it. And then so he's got some spare time. He's got a weekend off. So what does he choose to do? He gets in a car with a mate of his, hiring it from some hire company called Ruthless Hire or something like that. And then they speed at 96K through suburban streets while he's giggling like a little school kid in the passenger seat. And he posts this on social media. I mean, I mean just, you know, listen to that sentence again. And then, and then the, he posts it on social media. I mean, does does he actually not have a brain inside the skull or does he actually think that he's going to get away with whatever he does anyway because you and me in the PR department, it's our job to rewrite that story and cover it up somehow. I'm, I'm, I, I honestly, every weekend, mate, when one of these stories comes through, I just sit there and shake my head and go, how? how what thought process did you go through to decide that it was a good idea to, to show this to the world? Yeah, well... I mean, I wish I had some kind of answer to try and explain what's going on here, but it's absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? Driving through a suburban area where a kid could run out, oh, someone could bike, run out, anything, a door a dog, could open, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. anything could happen, right? And then, you know, at nearly 100 k's with uh, only a couple of metres either side between this moving vehicle and parked cars and there's, a, there's a speed humps and all sorts of things here, um, it's just dumb. And then to put it on, it's dumb to do it, you know, because you never know what the consequences are going to be. Well, you the don't consequences, know what other the consequences are, are life right? changing is what they are. If it goes wrong, your life completely pivots from that point on. You could be facing a oh, manslaughter well. charge. You could kill a kid. You could be seriously injured yourself. Your league career could be all of these things. And yet he's still prepared to do it. That's that's one dumb tick. Right. And now we're on to dumb tick number two. You don't put it on uh, the internet. He's had to remove his uh, Instagram page entirely and, 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 and X, I think that's what, well, was that used to be Twitter or whatever, um, which clearly shows that um, they know how stupid this is, all of them. If I was working PR for the NRL, I wouldn't want an annual salary. I wouldn't negotiate that way, Martin. I would negotiate on the seriousness of the stupidity that I had to PR myself uh, through. And uh, it doesn't get much stupider than this one. Now, clearly he wasn't driving, which is one thing that probably um, at least uh, goes in his favour. I mean, I thought for a moment that you can only see the arm on this bike, but the tattoos apparently weren't his. So it wasn't him driving, but... Whooping it up and enjoying it, keeping it gangster. PR company just says, let's take them to the cleaners here. I mean, this is going to take forever to clear up, if it ever does. It's just dumb. These clubs, they talk to the players. They tell the players oh, mate, about they've got, their They've got guys part. that come in every week, mate, and sit down and walk them through this stuff. You know, it's not It's not like, oh, my God, he's a young man. He didn't know what he was doing. Mate, they get highly paid individuals who sit there and drum it into you. You know, I mean, and yet, and then you get Valentine Holmes waving a bag of white paper. I mean, it just goes on and on, doesn't it? Another guy films himself <laughs> having sex with a dog. You know, they, you just sit there and you just go. Yeah. I mean, I know they're not Mensa students. We want them to run into each other and collide like trucks. But at the same time, you know, your salary and your lavish lifestyle and all the pretty girls and everything that comes with it is dependent on you just having a skerrick of brain inside your head. Just a small skerrick. That's all we're asking. There was a, uh, I saw a quote, I, I think it might have been from Andrew Johns uh, that I read over the weekend. And um, NRL uh, stands for not real long. You know, even the best NRL players don't have the longest careers. A huge majority play 20 games all this. A lot of them don't make the first two seasons. They have to move on through injury or whatever else it might be. And yet, even in the face of just being able to keep a clean sheet for somewhere between five and ten years, 
How many of them can't do that? Like, what does it actually mean? Go and start being a tradie. Go and get a job in a supermarket. Go and try and start your own business and just see how far you get because they really don't get at that young age just how well off they are. And it's not just about the money. It's about all the other things that come with it that means they don't always have to spend That's all it, of their, their own, own money. money. It's exactly right. You know, I mean, these uh, little extras they get, even medical, Martin. You know, these guys get looked after. Oh, they don't pay you dental. You and I, we're they don't pay 50 dental. to 100 no, yeah, yeah, bucks it. to go to the doctor. That's it. No, they don't pay none of that kind of stuff. Okay, they don't pay. And also the other freebies they get, the 90-inch TV on the wall, the free car that they get. Yeah, the, the, I mean, you name it, but... Yeah, it's just you sit there and you just think, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know what we do with this one. I, I mean, okay, look, um, he was, he was, he was rushing an injured dog to the. Oh no, vet, no, that's not going to work. Um, yeah, we can't link him to the Bondi victims. That's a bugger because otherwise he could have been no. a mobile ambulance. That would have been quite a good one. Could to... could he have just been late for training and he didn't want to disappoint the rest of the team? Good, I that's mean, not bad. Could we go that's down? not bad. He had to get there on time. Yeah. he's been late before. Yeah, his 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 friends they they realised what this means yeah, to him. Yeah. they sped him to the ground to get, get him to, him to training. Yeah, yeah. they made it on time and luckily no one got run over. Yeah, the only thing with that is that he was he was on a buy that week. So okay, let's we got to work. Okay, okay. Right well, here. I mean, look, I'm working hard here as PR. <laughs> as I said, it's a case by case basis. That's a thousand bucks. That idea. Now I've got to come up with another one, but I'm still claiming that cash. That's our podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to listen to the entire show, one to four, Monday to Friday, download the Platform app and via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to whatever shows over however many weeks at your leisure, at your listening pleasure, Platform Plus. First thing to do, though, is download the Platform app. Devlin. Unbelievable. Incredible. The Platform.